Nick Kyle's fourth period class at Putnam City High School is involved in a lot of aspects of the art world. There's painting, sculpture, drawing, and commercial arts. And there are crafts like weaving, pottery, and wood carving. Last year, five Putnam High graduates went to OU and OSU as art majors. Two are on full scholarship. Art is important to the 300 students enrolled in art classes at the school. They need a lot of paint, pencils, papers, and brushes, not to mention 5,000 pounds of clay. Kyle says it would be a big mistake if cutbacks were required to trim the arts. He says these classes are needed. It's extremely important because there's no other area of the curriculum where the sensitivity and area of thinking is trained, except in this area. Not only is that important to all of school members, but it's important to also train those people who are future draftsmen, artists, commercial artists, designers. Everything you touch is designed by an artist. Right now, Kyle's class shouldn't worry. The revenue losses during the last three months haven't been large enough to require major cutbacks. But even if the losses were greater, Superintendent Ralph Downs wouldn't want to cut art. I'm not ready at all to start even talking about cutting art, music, things like that. To me, those are still very important parts of your curriculum. Very important. So in the foreseeable future, Nick Kyle will have all the help he needs to train these budding Picassos and Jackson Pollocks. Bill Ross, Action 4 at Putnam City High. I'll let y'all look in here in a second. All right. Now, Linda, look up. And now it means you can work. You can live your life in a sighted world. You can uh, develop your talents. You can drive. You can do whatever you want if you can see. And if and if it weren't for the eye bank, gifted surgeons, my family's support, I couldn't see. I couldn't work. I would. Uh, I'd be. I'd be blind. That's what it means. And through those families of the donor, the donor always says, I want to give my eyes, but it's the family who has to say yes. And when that family calls the doctor and says, we want to donate our son, our daughter, our husband, or our mother's eyes, that means that one of the hundreds of people that are waiting for a cornea transplant are going to be able to see like I do tonight, and honey, I can see you greatly.
James McCracken has lived in Rush Springs for 13 years. Now he's got a problem. During the last few months, McCracken's been upset about the way a Texas company has disposed of the drilling mud in this pit. The mud contains barium, arsenic, and chromium. McCracken and some of his neighbors worry the levels of toxicity may be dangerously high. They should have the results at the Also in the fight is Linda Taylor. She's joined McCracken in complaints to the Corporation Commission about the work of North American Disposal Incorporated. Last August, the commission gave the company a permit. But a week ago, the permit was withdrawn because new samples of the waste showed a cause for concern. My biggest concern is uh, there are about 30 or 35 wells being drilled around in this location, one on every section almost. And they're going to have a lot to dispose of, and if this guy is allowed to do this, he's going to have this toxic waste spread all over the country. Mrs. Taylor owns one of eight dairies around Rush Springs. She's worried that toxic waste could destroy all the grazing land in the area. But North American Disposal wonders what all the fuss is about. Larry Lipscomb is not happy about having a half million dollars in equipment sitting idle. He says the waste is not dangerously toxic. Lipscomb vehemently denies charges that he sometimes sprays the waste on top of the ground instead of injecting it more than a foot into the earth. If you're putting it underneath the ground, number one, you're going to stop any kind of runoff that it could, could occur. You know, if you could go out into a field and drop out, you know, thousands of barrels of fluid on top of the ground, you might have an ugly runoff problem. This way, you don't have a runoff problem. Whether Lipscomb will again be able to dispose of the waste or whether McCracken can permanently stop him is up to the Corporation Commission. Their next hearing is scheduled for January 4th. Bill Ross, Action 4 in Rush Springs. For the past decade, Heritage Hills and the surrounding area has been considered one of the stabler parts of Oklahoma City. But recently, the number of homes on the market here has increased. In some blocks, there are as many as four houses for sale. Realtors admit that some of the homeowners are selling because of financial problems. But that is the exception rather than the rule. You've got a, a lot younger population living in the Heritage Hills, the Mesta Park, the Gatewood areas than you did several years ago. Because they are younger, they're more mobile. Sharon Linhart and her husband bought their home 12 years ago. They are self-professed renovators who want to move on to a new project. Other homeowners have other reasons for selling, but lowered interest rates mean a better buying market. Linhart says there is no reason to worry. I think when we see all the building downtown, when it really gets together down there, which it is now doing, um, you're going to see really many viable neighborhoods come alive in the downtown area. And what better place? I mean, you can come down here and buy a home for less per square footage, restore it, put your life blood in it, and uh, you've got a mansion. The people in Heritage Hills and the surrounding neighborhood say that it isn't just their corner of town. There are a lot of homes on the market all over Oklahoma City. This seems to be a good time to buy or sell. And these people seem to think that more home buyers are going to want to do it here than just about any place else. Charles Schnitzer, Action 4 in Heritage Hills. Everything that we have built, we have filled up, and we have not gained one bit from any of our uh, actions to try to get a hold of this problem. I will tell you now that if we do all of these things, being the prophet and the seer, we will fill those up, and then we'll be pushing the walls, and we will say, what are we going to do now? We have not solved the problem, and the taxpayers will be affording the bills uh, for what we have done.
existing employees that you almost need to have some kind of a grandfather that far behind. Brand new employees should probably be limited to one week of vacation per year and then be able to uh, work their way up as they are, spend more time working for the state of Oklahoma. Fifteen days sick leave. What we would like to see them do is decrease it to ten from zero to five years and increase it to 24 after 20 years. So there's a trade-off there to reward long-term loyal employees. To all of us, the Oklahoma public should be aware that although our industry friends are in the business of excessive alcohol, as I, I would have to defer that to someone that's in that There are those people who will, from time to time, drink and drive. As a point of reference, I would suggest to you that on any given weekend night, there will be more than 200,000 people in Oklahoma who might take a drink before they drive. This program is aimed at those people, from teenagers to adults, we want those people to know that if they are going to drink and drive, there are limits that will be most helpful to them in, in, in making their decision as to when they should drive. People have already been adjudicated and been fined for a municipal offense are able to get out of jail if they've got a job, if they promise to pay the money on at certain increments. So that's the time pay system. The OR system, the own recognizance system, says that if you've got a job and you don't can't make the bond for a municipal offense, then you're promising that you'll appear at the time scheduled The nickel a gallon gasoline tax increase comes at a time when Oklahomans are paying the lowest gas prices in quite a while. Competition and a gas surplus have pushed prices for regular down to 98 cents at some stations. Unleaded can be had for a dollar three. Oklahomans are enjoying the low prices, but most of the bargain hunters accept the idea of raising fuel taxes to pay for fixing up roads. I don't mind paying them. Poor truckers, I feel for them. I don't, I don't mind paying another five cents a gallon. I guess if it will, it will provide jobs and provide job training, but uh, I'm not sure it's the best way to go. If it goes up a nickel, we'll pay it. If we can see the improvement, I guess it'd be worth it because it's been higher than this before it started coming down. Oklahomans presently pay 10 and a half cents a gallon in state and federal gas taxes. The additional tax will raise that total to 15 and a half cents a gallon. Scott Wallace, Action 4, Northwest Oklahoma City. Everybody knows Christmas falls on December 25th. It was that day last year. It's that day this year. It'll probably be that day in the 31st century. But that doesn't seem to matter. Can I just get a bottle of small? People are always going to wait until the last minute to buy Christmas presents. Nobody knows exactly why that is, but all the procrastinators have a reason. Time, I guess, not having enough time to do everything. Next year, you're going to start earlier? I, no, I always say that and I never do, so there's no sense in saying it. <laughs> oh, we just do it every year. Most time we wait till Christmas Eve night, but everybody's closing before night this time, so we got to get out today. 
Isn't that a little uh, risky, waiting so late? Yes, because we're not finding what we're looking for. <laughs> Just about everything's gone. Next year, you're going to go earlier? I doubt it. Never do. <laughs> I'm broke. I had to wait for Christmas box. Well, I just got married Saturday, so I had to wait till after the wedding to do all my shopping for Christmas. So. People give you gifts at the last minute you're not expecting, and we feel that you have to reciprocate sometimes. I have a lot of things to do. <laughs> you know how it is. Mom, I hope you like your gift. <laughs> If you're going to be joining these late shoppers tonight, it might be a good idea to remember a friendly reporter. Just have it wrapped and address the card to Bill Ross, Action 4. Either for the peak or the needs to um, to express the feelings and resolve them so that they don't have to collect the browns. I have found that when they're not able to cash. There is another factor here, and I think it has to do with the with the fact that toward the end of the year we become reflective about past mistakes or our feelings of inadequacies, and we need to take a positive look at that and only look at them in order to improve um, whatever. Um, whatever our life is in order to try to fulfill it better the next year, the coming year. Morton Grove, Illinois is a small suburb outside Chicago. In February, the town's board of trustees passed two ordinances. One banned the sale of firearms in the city limits. The other made it illegal to possess a handgun in Morton Grove. Some citizens turned in their guns to the police, but others challenged the second ordinance in the courts. That challenge was based on the Second Amendment. A federal district court upheld the town's ordinance. For the last six months, their ruling has been considered by a higher court. Now the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals has upheld the Morton Grove ordinance. The court ruled that the Second Amendment doesn't apply to state and local regulation of firearms. But even if it did apply, the majority said the ordinance would still be valid because the Second Amendment ties the right to bear arms to the preservation of a militia. The attorney for the Oklahoma Rifle Association isn't happy with the decision. The court uh, decided the result they wanted and they papered the opinion to get to that point. I think it's a, an example of uh, uh, Constitution be damned, uh, intent of the framers of the Constitution be damned. We're going to get the decision we want regardless of what the Constitution says or what the uh, uh, intent of the framers of the Constitution was. And Poole says some Oklahoma communities may now try to follow Morton Grove's lead. That would certainly bring an outcry from those people in our state who believe bearing arms is their constitutional right. Bill Ross, Action 4. Oil field activity has been slow in recent months, but there are people making some money in the oil business. They are the oil field thieves, and they're hauling off an annual $2 billion a year from the oil patch. Oil field personnel are keeping closer tabs on the equipment they work with these days. This field contains millions of dollars worth of equipment and items like compressors or hot items on the market. They can be carried off by two men and a pickup and often are. Drill bits are another piece that fascinate the thieves. They are stolen by the hundred and sold for large profit. But the thieves must have a place to sell their findings, so they head for the nearest contractor. Why would a contractor buy something that he would assume is hot? Work's slow right now. There's not much going on. Why, uh, other contractor, it would save them a lot of money by buying that stuff, you know. If they get it for maybe two bits on the dollar or 20 cents on the dollar, why, yes, they'd buy it. I'm sure they would. 
they will steal anything. Drilling executives like Bill Glass know firsthand the problems oil field theft has on the economy, and they feel present identification laws are not helping the problem. Uh, it's inoperable because you have to have uh, people from the OSBI to stamp this equipment, and you're talking about millions of items, millions of items, in just Oklahoma. Experts predict that the oil men themselves will have to keep a closer eye on their equipment if the billion dollar industry of oil field theft is to be thwarted. Kevin Ogle, Action 4. Friends and relatives tried to keep warm in the December wind by eating hot chili and stew. They were there to give moral support to farmers who were going back to the nation's capital one more time. And they're taking this tractor, the same one driven in 1979 when the ag men went to Washington to tell a peanut farmer they needed help. The tractor will be placed in the Smithsonian Institute as a reminder of that call for support. And support is what the farmers say they need now in order to keep things going. We're going to try to get some of these farm bills changed so we can make a profit in agriculture because we've got to. We're, we're almost at death's door in Oklahoma now. I was in Washington the uh, first week in December and uh, lobbying among the uh, representatives and senators there. And I, I had very good reception from every one of them. However, they don't always vote like they talk. <laughs> the tractor with trucks following pulled out of El Reno early this afternoon and will travel to Arkansas where the Razorback farmers will take over and drive to Tennessee. It will be like that all the way to the Capitol, each state taking turns and showing their own support. So the farmers are traveling again to the large cities and the small towns on their way to Washington to tell the people there they need help and they need it now. Kevin Ogle, Action 4 on Interstate 40. A clerk researches recent court cases. This could be a law library anywhere, but it's not just anywhere. This law library is behind the walls at McAllister State Penitentiary. The law clerks are inmates serving time in Oklahoma's toughest prison. The 12 law clerks are known as jailhouse lawyers. They write the briefs which detail the alleged violations of prisoners' constitutional rights. A recent federal court case could affect what they do. A Florida judge recently ruled that inmate law clerks and libraries aren't enough. The judge said that states must provide inmates with licensed lawyers. We need someone that really knows the law, that knows the procedures, know how to guide us in the law. And that's something we don't have. And with a qualified attorney here as a member of the staff, it would give us that what we needed. Keith, what would be some of the disadvantages of having a lawyer here? You're going to get a bunch of people that can't make it in society. Lawyers that have tried to practice law can't make it because they aren't any good at it. And the state's going to pay them $1,500, $1,600 a month to come in here and front their self off as attorneys. Everything can be used as evidence. The Florida decision has been appealed to a federal appeals court. The case could eventually be decided by the U.S. Supreme Court. In the meantime, Oklahoma's prison inmates will have to rely upon advice given by jailhouse lawyers. Scott Wallace, Action 4 at McAllister State Penitentiary. Because the guy told me. This retail liquor outlet has a revolving door today, a tremendous amount of volume being sold inside. But most of the people we talk to are buying their goods and taking them home, and they'll be staying there for various reasons. The checkers were busy sacking up bottles today at Byron's Liquor Store on Northeast 23rd and Broadway. 
The New Year cheer has prompted a lot of people to go out and buy their favorite spirit and ring in the New Year tonight. But a lot of celebrating will be done close to home. One of the contributing factors to that is fear of drunk drivers. That's the reason I'm staying close to home. So, because it's only about a mile to my house and I am a little concerned about drunken driving. And uh, so we are staying close to home. I'm going to avoid the drunk driver. I'm going to take all the back roads to a friend's house who actually just lives a few blocks, so there's no problem there. Getting uh, tickets for DWI and stuff like that, and I don't have that kind of money to give up, so I just come in and get what I want and go home and celebrate and have a good time. Besides being worried about the streets, some people just like spending New Year's at home. Yeah, there's more drunk drivers on the road, but it isn't really so much that is that it's it's nice to enjoy a New Year's celebration at home with your family, with the people that you care about, right? So why go to a bar where you don't know anybody and you're all just going to get drunk and get in trouble? So it seems this year more people are concerned about the drunk driving problem and are staying at home to make sure they don't become a statistic. Kevin Ogle, Action 4. to file my income tax return before the 15th of April this year. I would say to keep a clean house. <laughs> my New Year's resolution is to meet my last year's resolution, and that is to lose down to 176 pounds. I, I can't tell you in public. <laughs> oh, gosh. To get these braces off for one. Lay out in the sun, getting a little pale. To be happy and hope everybody can come together and be as one in the world. <laughs> Paying bills has never been fun especially if you've ever tried to pay an Oklahoma City water bill. Sometimes customers have gotten so frustrated with the slow system full of red tape that people have actually become violent. And now there are warning signs to remind city water users to remain calm. City officials have hired 18 additional full-time people to speed up waiting on customers. And now new water customers in Oklahoma City only have to make one stop for service instead of going to the three or four city hall locations in the past. But there is still one problem yet to be solved. We do lose some calls. Um, people don't want to hold on as long as it takes. And they will call back perhaps the next day. But the biggest, I think, frustration they may feel is that they do have to hold on before a public service clerk is able to answer that call and get the nature of their inquiry. The new one-stop system to install meters won't affect longtime customers. But it will help free up more staff to check out complaints. 1983 promises to be a new beginning for water service in the city. If there is a problem with your water bill or if you just need questions answered, officials say their goal is to help customers in a 15-minute time span. The department feels it's off to a good start. Ed Stewart, Action 4 near downtown Oklahoma City. Thank 
goodness it started. But this morning, a few hundred motorists in Oklahoma City weren't so lucky. Cold weather puts extra stress on your engine. And if you haven't already, now's a good time to winterize your car. I had a car that was hesitating a little bit in the stop signs and at the signal lights when you started to accelerate. And I wanted my car to be in perfect condition for the winter driving. Getting a tune-up is one of the most important steps in winterizing your car. The mechanic should make a complete check of everything under the hood. Well, the most important thing is the preventive maintenance aspect. Uh, you pay them now or you pay them later, and I think it's uh, to the uh, motorist uh, advantage.